So I'm sure that Dr. Sheffield is sitting there very nervous wondering what I'm going to say when I introduce him. But I'll behave myself, Bill, I promise. Um, Dr. Sheffield is uh, many things, amongst which he's a professor of pathology and um, molecular medicine at McMaster. He's also uh, our associate director for research at Canadian Blood Services. Bill has a, a long history with the blood system, that, which uh, dates back to days when he and I were both much younger. And uh, we've asked him to close our meeting with our final presentation today by talking to us about uh, something we've heard not a whole lot about today, which is more about uh, the use of uh, controlling bleeding with plasma factors in uh, Bill's focuses in animal models. So I'm going to ask Bill to come up and uh, tell us all about it. Thank you, Dana. So, being a trained observer, I noticed several things. One was, I was the last speaker, <coughs> or as many, pe many last speakers say, the only thing standing between you and the refreshments. I noticed I came after a brave young man who told us about his journey, surviving cancer. And I wondered how I was going to approach it, and I decided I'd look at my slides and see what came into my head and then into my mouth, and that's what we're going to do. So, um, what I would like to talk to you about today, I'll talk a little bit about the origins of plasma transfusion, um, what I can see of, as the evidence base. Um, some people might not agree. I will claim I'm just a poor, humble biochemist and not a clinical trialist, so don't hate me. Uh, we'll look through some animal models to investigate bleeding, uh, to investigate the relationship between transfusing plasma and controlling bleeding. Um, in the letter of invitation or the email of invitation that I got to come and speak to you, it was something about talking about animal models. So I felt duty bound to talk about other people's animal models, but I will do my best to minimize their contributions and to talk more about what I've done because that's what I'd like to do. Um, speaking of what I've done, uh, we have something called, we call the Becca mouse model. After reading other people's clinical trials for many years, I realized that what you really need is a great acronym. And I didn't have any acronyms. So I thought about calling uh, our model the blood exchange coagulopathy approach, or BECA. And as soon as I started calling it BECA, I felt better about the work. It got funded. <laughs> it got published. So BECA. Um, in more, I will share with you some of our unpublished data uh, in which we've started thinking that plasma is a relatively dilute biological fluid. And maybe we could use more concentrated sources of some coagulation factors. And we've done some work with um, two of the factor concentrates which are distributed by Canadian Blood Services, uh, more on the prothrombin complex concentrate than on the fibrinogen concentrate. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about those other models, but again, I will, I will attempt to dissuade you from being too interested in that stuff. Okay, so I have some models of Dr. Bethune. I don't think Dr. Hess is still with us, so um, re with reference to his previous characterization of Dr. Bethune, see, I started out, I was going to say I was honored to be speaking at the Norman Bethune Symposium, and then, and then Dr. Hess told us all that dirt about Norman. So, <laughs> at any rate, um, here we see Dr. Norman Bethune in China, 1938, uh, making a contribution uh, medically and perhaps politically um, to the unfortunate, the terrible situation that is a war. And on the right hand side you can see uh, a picture of, um, you know, b before long the war which had already come to Asia spread throughout the world. This is the Second World War. And um, you can see on the right hand side of the panel, uh, right hand side of the slide, uh, over there, uh, this is a picture um, from someone's National Archives about the, a wounded soldier receiving a field plasma transfusion in Italy. And the reason I show this is both to link plasma transfusion to Dr. Bethune and also to point out that it is a well-established medical procedure. It's been around for a long time. But it seems to have reversed the, or, the natural order of things if we think that what happens in the pharmaceutical industry is the natural order of things. Because there, in vitro results, lead to preclinical work in animals, which then lead to clinical trials and clinical implementation of the findings. But as far as I can see, 
perhaps because of the immediacy of war and the great need, um, plasma transfusion entered into medical practice without a lot of those other things. Now, in fairness, there are significant immunological barriers to, um, let's say, testing human plasma in, uh, in animal model systems, but nevertheless, I think some of, some of this history um, resonates today. So what clinical evidence supports the value of plasma transfusion? Uh, previous speakers touched on this peripherally, but more in the setting of trauma, where multiple blood products are being given to people who are grievously injured. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw Simon Stanworth and colleagues under the bus. So Simon and his colleagues have taken a, uh, a very evidence-based look at this, and they say that there's no level one randomized clinical trial evidence that plasma transfusion is effective in reducing bleeding or for that matter in any other of its clinical indications with the exception of plasma exchange in TTP. And to support their summary, their somewhat bleak summary of what you might call this evidentiary desert, uh, they point out that 80 randomized controlled trials have failed to find evidence of any benefit. Nevertheless, we've seen that many physicians are convinced that plasma transfusion can be life-saving. There's huge amounts of, of um, anecdotal evidence. There's uh, clinical trials that are in progress. There are controversial results in the recent clinical trial area. So we looked at all this and we thought, well, what contribution can, can we make? Um, because it sure sounds biologically plausible, because plasma contains all of the soluble coagulation factors. If you're bleeding, you have coagulopathy, your blood cl can't clot, and it seems like a reasonable thing to do to give that back. So, um, and then since, um, since I'm a molecular biologist who found that he had to use animal models to test some of the really cool proteins that he got to make in the lab, I started to think of animal models. And uh, if you survey the literature, uh, essentially, what, what your task is, is you want to make an animal coagulopathic. You want to give them a tendency towards bleeding. And how could you do that? You can do this by hemodilution, by rapidly giving them things that are not blood in their circulation and diluting out the normal components. You can do it by trauma. And of course, if, you do, if, if you're in, working in the trauma setting, you are modeling a, a critical a medical problem that is clearly life-threatening, but it is a very complex situation in which to experiment. Um, you can induce coagulopathy via genetic deficiency, and that's where I was first introduced to this area in terms of um, um, mice that were deficient in coagulation factor 9, so they are models for hemophilia B. Or you can do it via exchange transfusion. You can, take away per you can take perfectly good blood from the animal and replace it with something else. So um, animal models of coagulopathy. They are dominated by swine, and I'm not talking about the researchers here, and by complexity. For reasons I don't understand, pig, pigs in the literature are known as swine. I think this is a specialized term. I don't quite get it, but they are to those of us who work with smaller mammals, just they're, they're pigs. Anyway, so the trauma models are dominated by pigs, probably because it's a larger animal, because there's a lot of surgical interventions going on, and these are very complex models. So when Frith um, surveyed the literature uh, a few years ago, um, he found 43 studies uh, of, in terms of animal models of, of trauma-induced coagulopathy. Um, hemodilution was employed, traumatic injury, uncontrolled hemorrhage. Uh, at that point, couldn't find any where plasma had been used as a treatment. More recently, others have used this, uh, this model. Um, it's, it's a very complex model and it, model, it, and it mimics a complex situation. So for instance, Imamidol in a paper in the journal, journal Neurotrauma, um, in their variation on this pig model, um, anesthetized animals, of course, or it wouldn't get by animal research ethics, uh, the ribs were broken, the liver and brain was damaged, uh, a controlled um, um, hemorrhage was employed to reduce the blood volume, then they were left in shock for a number of hours, simulating these very complex clinical situations, and then they were resuscitated with FFP or saline. And after all that, it was found that the brain lesion, because this was a, 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 neuro, a neurological um, a model, was smaller with FFP. 
Um, and there are other models where people combined elements. So they took, in, in one instance, they took FFP and they used it as the hemodilution agent. So they took a lot of human FFP and diluted the, uh, the, the uh, blood volume of, of, the, uh, of the pig or the swine, depending on what you'd like to call them. Um, and as I mentioned, existing mouse models, we found they were dominated by knockouts. And that, that really didn't help us because we, we, we were trying to ask the question, does, does plasma transfusion relate to bleeding tendency? And if so, what components within the plasma are important? And eventually we got to, and if that's the case, then what can we replace the plasma with? So we came up with BECA. I've already um, told you about how fond I am of, of, of the acronym, so I won't, I won't bore you with that again. What is BECA? So it's a, we use blood exchange. We, take, we do four cycles of removing half a mil of blood, of whole blood, which is a significant volume in an animal this small. They're only about 25 grams. Um, and we take out uh, whole blood. We replace it with washed red blood cells in a human albumin solution, so a colloidal solution intended on mimicking plasma, which has no coagulation activity. Um, you may wonder why we do, do this and why we didn't do something simpler, like simple hemodilution or replacement with, um, without red blood cells. And the simple an answer is, as we were the developing the model, every time we tried to do these more aggressive things, the mice didn't make it. Um, so we worked with what was feasible. Um, so at the end, we came up with this model whereby, yes, we, there was some anemia. Red blood cells were down twofold. There was some thrombocytopenia. Platelets were down threefold. Um, and all the plasma proteins had been reduced by a factor of five. So it was, there was approximately 20% of all of the plasma proteins, 20% albumin, 20% factor nine, 20% fibrinogen. This increased the prothrombin time, so we had laboratory evidence of coagulopathy. The prothrombin time uh, is similar to the INR, and we found that compared to non-exchanged animals, the, on a, on a, uh, when we transected the tail on these anesthetized animals, there was a, a significant increase in the amount of blood lost. So from the point of view of the reductionist objectives we'd set ourselves, we'd set up a situation whereby we had created a coagulopathy and a bleeding diathesis. So next we asked whether this responded to plasma. So we gave a dose that was in the clinical range. We give uh, 0.3 uh, mils, which is 12 mils per kilogram, which is in the 10 to 15 mils per kilogram clinical range for transfusible plasma. Um, we found, as many of you who work with animal models will, know, will well know, that there's a certain amount of variability. And we found that in order to work with this, we had to use groups of at least 15 mice. Otherwise, the innate variability became too, uh, too much to see any effect. So what we saw was when we trans, uh, transfused the animals with wild-type plasma at that level, we could significantly reduce the amount of blood loss. And having set up this situation, we could ask questions about what was important in the plasma. And so if we look in Canada at what our regulators tell us is important about plasma quality, we find out that there's only one marker, and it's coagulation factor 8. But many people have suggested that's not a particularly good marker for what plasma is transfused for, for its indications. And in our model, we found that if we used um, um, plasma from factor eight knockout mice containing no factor eight whatsoever, um, this worked just as well. Conver uh, on the other hand, if we substituted uh, plasma from fibrinogen knockout mice, that plasma was ineffective. So we felt that we'd started to make, uh, we had something that was somewhat useful. Um, people have said this is not a trauma model. That's true. It's not intended to be a trauma model. Remember, I'm a poor, humble country biochemist. If only I had a shot of Star Trek where I could be, uh, I could be the doctor and I could be telling, I guess this would make you Jim, Dana. It's a good thing I don't have a slide of, of Star Trek. It's a very good thing because, uh, well, if you're not, no, you're certainly not Lieutenant Uhura, so we're just going to leave it at that. So um, no, slide, no Star Trek slide and, um, oh yeah, back to being a poor, hum humble country biochemist. Um, we, may, we tried to keep these variables as, we tried to change as few variables as possible. So these animals are not hypovolemic. They have a normal blood volume. This is a situation where we, we asked for simple things and we got simple things and we can ask relatively simple questions. Um, we weren't, many people have also criticized the tail model injury. They have pointed out the anatomically 100% uh, 
uh, correct point that most humans do not have tails. And uh, those who are somewhat deeper thinkers point out that in transecting the tail, you cut two veins in an artery. So we thought, okay, we need an independent way of assessing um, whether we've, we've done what we think we've done to hemostasis in vivo. And uh, what we used here was a laser injury model whereby an injury was made in the intact microvasculature. This was done in Heyu Ni's lab, one of my uh, co-investigators. Um, and in this situation, so we, we recreated the Becca model, and he was very, he told me he didn't think the animals would survive both that, that manipulation and this manipulation, but they did. And we were able to determine that, so here we were asking about the ability of the system to form a thrombus. So it's an intact vasculature, it's another readout for coagulation. And indeed we found results which mirrored what we'd seen with the tail clip. So um, here we see the, uh, the size of the thrombus, which is imaged using fluorescent plate platelets, um, increased by transfusion of wild-type uh, plasma. Uh, not, uh, in a, uh, fibrinogen knockout plasma was ineffective, and um, and uh, factor eight knockout plasma was as effective as wild type as we'd seen in the other model. So this encouraged us because it seemed like from two completely different models we were coming to a similar um, a similar endpoint. There are other things we can do with the system. So we. Uh, I naively suggested that we, we would have no difficulty in absorbing out the natural antibodies which, which make very difficult xenotransfusion. I was wrong and I won't talk about that anymore. I did have a workaround which was to take purified human plasma proteins and reconstitute plasma. And we're getting somewhere with that but it's, it's pretty messy and the effect versus the background is not large. What I will tell you about in the time remaining is how uh, we've used this model and expanded the model into a more, into an additional uh, hemostatic challenge involving transection of the liver uh, in order to ask whether we could get the same effect that we'd seen with plasma with uh, concentrated, with factor concentrates, PCCs and fibrinogen. So PCCs are, um, probably many people in this audience know what they are. They're products of plasma fractionation. I have had to, I've, I've encountered people who think that the plasma fractionators have six enormous vats and they have people who go and they scoop lyophilized proteins from one vat to another and then they combine them and the vats are labeled prothrombin, factor 7, factor 9, factor 10, protein C and protein S. And that's not the way plasma fractionation works. Instead, these products are enriched in those proteins. They have a background of all the other plasma proteins at very, very low levels. So um, these products are recommended uh, for urgent reversal, uh, reversal of warfarin. So if patients are on oral anticoagulation and their physicians need to urgently reverse them, perhaps because of surgery, because, perhaps because they're bleeding, um, and they're concentrated about 25-fold over uh, the levels of those factors in plasma. Um, so uh, we turned to our model and we said, okay, let's see how PCCs work. And we'd done some previous work in this area that was a lot easier. There we'd given uh, mice uh, doses of warfarin or we'd given them dibigotranotexalate, oral anticoagulants, and we'd sought to reverse those effects. And what we found there was similar to what people see uh, in, in the clinical, in the preclinical, and then in clinical practice, that PCCs are effective at, uh, uh, in, in that manner. But here we were asking if they were more of a general hemostatic agent. And we found we could get an equivalent effect to plasma at a dose which corresponds to one of the doses uh, recommended for warfarin reversal. I think it was, the doses have changed a little bit over time, but this was the one that was recommended by the National Advisory Committee in 2008. And we did a dose response, uh, titrating downwards, and we uh, found uh, pleasingly that there was indeed a dose response. Um, yesterday, I was dropping by posters, much like is done here, but for students at McMaster University who've done Biochemistry 3 R06, and I saw someone who'd started to do a titration curve, but there was no, like, they, they went from two micromolar of their agent down to 100 nanomolar, and there was no difference. I said, do you ever think you might have a buffer effect? Because when we, when we do a dose response, we like to see a difference. And, and um, I think I scared the young person, so I won't talk about that anymore. So our next question, uh, kind of, um, I guess, 
as an extension of that idea about the pharmaceutical industry or the plasma fractionation industry having big vats, they don't have the big vats, but we have access to purified uh, prothrombin factor 7, factor 9, and factor 10. And so we were asking the question, and you're all going to say, of course, that you already know the answer. The answer is, is the anti-hemorrhagic effect, the question, sorry, not the answer, the question is, is the anti-hemorrhagic effect of PCC due to its vitamin K dependent coagulation factors? And you're all saying, duh, of course it is. But in experimental science, we need to demonstrate these things. And I had a reason for doing that because I thought if we could show that, then we could do more reductionism and we could ask if all of the components are required. So we went ahead and did that, and we found indeed that, co that combinations of those four factors, without any protein C or protein S, uh, where we could, we did the titration curve or the dose response, and we found that, that we could find a combination of what we called modified PCC that was just as effective as plasma or just as effective as the commercial PCCs in reducing bleeding. And we said, that's kind of interesting. What happens if we only use three factors? And the answer was that we could, we could omit any one of the four factors in turn unless we left out prothrombin. And if we left out prothrombin, the mixture was not that effective. I thought, that's kind of interesting. I wonder if that points to the fact that maybe prothrombin is one of the key factors in plasma. And we continue to pursue that uh, concept. So um, we thought it would be uh, nice uh, in, to show another... Um, um, an, so we're, we're still in the BECA model. We've still got blood exchange mice, but we added a different hemostatic uh, challenge, which we found in the literature, uh, which involves uh, the, uh, the transection of the liver, uh, the surgically exposed liver, and the, the simple expedient or readout of capturing the, uh, the shed blood into a teared weigh boat, which you can then weigh at the end of the observation period. Um, so it's a very simple model. And... Um, we were encouraged to find that we saw the same, um, the same hierarchy of, re of results. So first of all, we did in normal mice because people told me that Becca mice couldn't survive liver transection, but, but they were actually wrong, or at least for the 15-minute period of observation. I make no claims about what would happen to the mice after that, um, but it is, it is actually doable. We first uh, did experiments in normal mice where we showed that um, we could get an effect with PCC, and we could similarly get an anti-hemorrhagic effect with our homemade factors, unless we lacked prothrombin, in which case it doesn't work. And we saw the same, uh, the same uh, pattern of results with Becca mice. So what about fibrinogen? And um, since I am a believer in human rights, I didn't show you the coagulation cascade, uh, and I thought about not doing it at all, given the lateness of the hour and all the all the learning and, and uh, stuff that you've done all day long. But then I couldn't help myself. So, uh, so essentially, if our is down here, and the various uh, procoagulant factors, the four vitamin K de dependent procoagulant factors are up here. And essentially we thought, well, if we can drive the system forward with some of these factors, then why not the one that's right down at the, at the business end, just before the formation of, of fibrin? Um, so we've done a little bit of work with, fi with uh, fibrinogen in the BECA model. Uh, we found that it's very hard to get a response to fibrinogen. We have to go to very high doses. So um, I would say it grudgingly responds um, to, to quite high doses of, of fibrinogen. So perhaps that tells us something about the sensitivity of the system to fibrinogen, and perhaps there's some clinical parallels, as was mentioned by some of the earlier speakers. And we're, we're, we're thinking, well, we've, okay, all right, we've proposed in a funding application um, that we will continue to investigate this in terms of PCCs and fibrinogen. There are, for reasons that escape me, this is the standard of care for trauma patients in Austria. And since I'm not a trialist, I will say no more. But we thought that perhaps we should investigate this experimentally where we have control of all, almost all the, well, all the variables. Yes. Uh, one of the reviewers of my previous grant application, or my current grant application, said something about, I have no do doubt that Dr. Sheffield will learn a lot about transfusion in the mouse. Or mouse, mouse tra anyway, the clear implication was it was only good for mice and had nothing to do with humans. So, for unexplained reasons, I got funded. 
So we continue with the experimental plan, but this kind of weighed on me and I thought about the fact that I often, in my administrative role at CBS, I say to people, so what's your translational path? So I looked myself in the mirror and I said, what's your translational path? And I tried this stuff about I'm a poor, country, humble country biochemist and it didn't work. So I thought we should actually do some work in a human system. And of course we'll start in vitro. We will, well, we can't go further in vitro without clinical partners. So let's start in vitro. So what we did was to try to mimic what we'd done to the mice. So we diluted um, human normal pool plasma to 20% reaction volume. We made some other adjustments to take into account um, the uh, anticoagulants. Um, and then we said, okay, uh, we had an animal with a, with, a plasma with a blood volume of about a mil that we added in 300 microliters of treatment fluid. So what would that look like? And so that's what we compared. So we did these diluted PTTs, and in the lower panel, no, for, first of all, fortunately, human plasma is more sensitive to this kind of dilution in this assay than is mouse, so that was fortunate. And uh, what we found, again, was, this, was the same kind of pattern. We could reduce the PT, or we could promote coagulation. We have co more rapid coagulation um, if we use PCC or if we use the four-factor homemade uh, modified PCC. Um, but we couldn't get quite the same effect if we were using three-factor. And we tried this also in thrombin generation assays, making the same assumptions. So we, dilute, we set up our reaction volume, and then we hit it with the... Um, uh, with tissue factor, calcium, and the fluorogenic substrate, and we found the same thing. So essentially, although the shape of the curve is different, this is what happens when we put in our four factor, this is what happens when we put in PCCs, the area under the curve is similar, you get a different shape and you get more thrombin generation, probably because you haven't introduced the anticoagulant factors here that you have here. But what, what I was more interested in was that when we when we use saline as the simulated treatment fluid or we use the three-factor uh, concentrate lacking prothrombin, we get the same effect. So you have to look at this a little bit sideways or be an optimist or a combination of both, um, but I think we have some data that suggests there may be uh, something to what we see in the mouse in the human system. And we're going to try and continue to look at what happens in vivo in our model and what happens in vitro with different tests, including Rotem. Uh, so, what about what have other people seen? Um, there's a larger literature in terms of PCC administration in a, in um, in other animal models, um, and what was found can be summarized is that it's heterogeneous, and it's not terribly surprising because the doses and the timing of intervention are different among these different models. So, PCC administration reduced blood loss after liver or bone injury, but not spleen injury in the pig. Um, that's a, there's a couple of studies out on that, some of which come from industry. Um, I, I asked one of my colleagues to do a literature review um, for a, a, a corporate purpose at Canadian Blood Services um, in the last couple of months. And he came back with something that was really focused on whether a company sponsored or it was not company-sponsored, and, uh, and I thanked him and told him I didn't realize he was a bomb-throwing anarchist and that I, I generally looked more at the controls than the sponsorship, but at any rate, some of these uh, uh, studies come from companies because they fit into the preclinical to clinical spectrum of normal uh, development. Um, there's some work in, in, in rabbits, um, again, um, it, it's, a, it's a mixed bag, so we're not quite sure um, how to interpret that. So what does all this mean? So as I, as I have said at length, and some of you might say ad nauseum, I started out as a biochemist, it kind of looks like mass action. I mean, if you provide more uh, factor, if you're, if you're in a first order reaction, so A, there's some kind of change, and you get B. So we know that the reaction velocity is proportional to, to A, to the, to the input. So that if, if you think of the reactions of fibrinogen leading to fibrin, and you provide more starting material, perhaps that's what's going on. Now, there's an awful lot of complexities in coagulation. There's cellular interactions, there's surfaces, there's all kinds of things going on. But I think um, our data and other people's data suggest that you don't necessarily need all the coagulation factors. 
in the setting that we have deliberately engineered. And you have to think about that because there's 20, the mice have 20% residual coagulation. We tried to drive them down lower. Bad things happened. So we're looking at a setting where, where the um, in vivo, where the host is definitely coagulopathic, but they're not devoid of coagulation factors, and you have to keep that in mind. I think one of the, uh, the examples that Dr. Hess showed, that uh, unfortunate soldier who'd had half his, his, uh, his or her, I couldn't tell from the picture, a leg chomped off. Um, you know, in that setting, there's probably very little left. They're probably almost certainly down below 20%, maybe 10%, maybe 5 not sure. Uh, we could not drive our model uh, down to those um, depths. So, um, I've had a lot of fun telling you about our research and casting aspersions on other people's research. Not really. I don't. That, that, was, that was just to try and enliven you because I don't know about you, but I felt that some of the air went out of the room at different times this, this afternoon for different reasons. So I tried to be a little, um, inject a little levity uh, with no disrespect to any of the very serious issues that have been uh, described. So. Uh, what have I told you? We found, or what, what did we find? We found that either um, the commercial uh, fractionation product, the PCCs, or our modified uh, PCCs, they reduce blood loss and bleeding times. I didn't focus on bleeding times. We have dutifully measured the bleeding times hand in hand with the blood losses because people look at different things in the literature and because reviewers, some, if you don't give them, if you only give them one, they sometimes ask for the other. In all cases, we find the bleeding times match the blood loss, except it's a discontinuous measure, so it's not quite as, um, as sensitive. Um, we found that three-factor combinations uh, may, be equally, uh, may be equally effective as the four-factor co uh, uh, combination. As I was writing up the manuscript, which is under review at the Journal of Thrombosis and Hemostasis for this, I came across a paper whereby a recombinant prothrombin had been used um, in hemophilia A and hemophilia B mice, and it was found to be effective in reducing bleeding. So, so maybe someone else has, has come across this effect that we are hoping to investigate further. Uh, we found that tail bleeding mimicked liver bleeding, and that relieved us because of the criticisms that have rightly been aimed at the tail bleeding model. And we have hope for some degree of transmissibility, or maybe some degree of, uh, of translating to if not the clinic, to the question of, of plasma quality of pl transfusable plasma as a product from our human in vitro test results. I think I have bored the person with the, the yellow sign into, uh, into inactivity because I, I haven't seen the yellow so sign yet. <laughs> I, I will discard that hypothesis since he's now smiling at me and just close, since I seem to have lots of time, by acknowledging the many people who were involved in this work. Uh, Louise Eltringham-Smith is, um, uh, and Varsha Bakta are research assistants in my laboratory. Dr. Saeed Kadri is a, as a postdoc who, who um, did, started to uh, move the model into the liver transection area. Uh, Melissa Lamborn, a former research assistant in the laboratory who really, really likes her dog. And uh, co-investigators, Dr. Ed Prystel and Dr. Hei Yu Ni, they helped me, they lent their reputations and names to the funding applications that allowed us to do this work. And Zi Li, Dr. Dili Rahiman, and Dr. Yiming Wang were, uh, are, uh, either were or are parts of uh, uh, Dr. Ni's group in Toronto. And I'm grateful for funding from um, the um, Canadian Blood Services Intramural Research Grant Program, and I'd be very happy to take any of your questions, and I salute you and commend you on remaining conscious at this point. <laughs> You're in conflict of interest, I want to... What kind of question would you like? <laughs> what, what, uh, what effect would you think that also adding platelets to your red cells in your BECA model might have? We thought about that during model development, but um, it got a bit dicey. Um, and we became aware of a paper from the Nieswant group 
in which they demonstrated that bleeding in mice is essentially insensitive to platelet levels until you cross the threshold of 3% of normal. So at that point, we became less concerned about um, platelets. I hope that answers your question. We have thought about various manipulations. We've thought about a mouse blood bank, and we've, we've thought about... I mean, the trauma area is compelling because of the need of the patients involved. But from a scientific point of view, it's just so complicated that I have tried, as I went on about at length, to, to keep to a more reductionist or a, a simplified approach and try and, uh, if we had findings, we could interpret them a lot easier. I was thinking especially in light of Hayu's laser model, that might make a difference, maybe not in the other models. But anyhow, and I was also wondering... Well, the sensitivity goes down. In, in, his, in normal mice, you have a lot more platelets, and therefore you have a lar lot larger signal from that thrombus. But it does work. So uh, as, as uh, one of our colleagues, Dr. Don Branch, said to me the other day, I say to Hayu, booyah. So, Bill, how much blood does a 25-gram mouse have? Like two mils or two uh, It's mils. between 6 to 8% of body weight. So you said when you take more than half a mil out, they die. Well, they essentially have a blood volume of around 2 mils, 1.5 to 2 mils. If we take out more than half a mil at a time and, and replace it with, let's say, Ringer's lactate, they don't die immediately, not on the first exchange, but we can't get to the fourth exchange without them expiring. And it's not a blood pressure issue? or, or Do you know what? what no, I don't think so, because we, take, we, take, we have them cannulated, so the, the half mil comes out so and the half actually, mil goes in. Yeah. yeah. And you, you, you say, oh, you did, you, how clever you are, Bill. You did that in order to simplify your model. Well, in part. But I also just balked at the idea of having to measure mouse blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> what do, does the heart stop or what kills them in, in the ones that don't make it definitely yes <laughs> yes um, okay so so th this is done under full ana this is done under full anesthetic cover and what we notice is that um, they, they exhibit um, labored breathing very labored breathing, and then we wonder whether they're still alive, and then we know they're not alive, and their, their, their hearts have stopped. So yes, it is circulatory fa failure for sure.